2025, a 90-year-old airplane drops onto the ice runway in Antarctica, calling scientists and fuel drums where no modern jet can land. It first flew in 1935. It fought in World War II. It fed Berlin during the airlift. And nearly nine decades later, it's still flying in Alaska, Africa, Colombia, and at the bottom of the world. This is the story of the Douglas DC-3, the plane that refuses to die. Picture yourself in 1930, standing under some rickety rag wing biplane as it sputters to life. You wouldn't have seen what was coming. The Douglas DC-3 grew out of the earlier DC-2 and something called the DST, the Douglas Sleeper Transport, which American Airlines basically begged Douglas to build. When it first flew on December 17, 1935, the same date as the Wright brothers' first flight, it marked a real turning point. Within a few months, this plane entered service and completely changed how commercial aviation worked. Here's what made it revolutionary. The DC-3 was the first airliner that could actually turn a profit just carrying passengers. Before this, airlines depended on government airmail contracts to stay in business, but the DC-3 changed that equation entirely. The design itself wasn't complicated, which turned out to be part of its genius. You had a sturdy aluminum fuselage, a thick wing with big split flaps that were pretty forgiving, and two large radial engines. Some of the early civilian versions used Wright R1820s, but most ended with Pratt & Whitney R1830 twin wasp engines putting out around 1200 horsepower each. These were the same engines you'd find in everything from Catalina flying boats to B-24 Liberators. When you combined those engines with the DC-3's wing design and that large tail, you got an airplane that could take off from short runways, climb without much fuss, and handle itself predictably even when things got rough. Then World War II happened and everything changed. The military version, designated C-47 Skytrain and then called Dakota by the British, took everything good about the DC-3 and beefed it up for combat conditions. Engineers added a cargo door, reinforced the floor, installed hoist fittings, and stripped out the civilian interior. Now you could carry 28 paratroopers, or 18 wounded soldiers on stretchers with medical staff, or roughly three tons of cargo ranging from ammunition to actual jeeps. These planes towed gliders across the English Channel, dropped paratroopers behind enemy lines, and landed on airstrips that were basically just cleared dirt. On D-Day alone, around 925 C-47s carried more than 13,000 paratroopers into Normandy, while others towed Waco and Horsa gliders loaded with more troops and equipment. It's not an exaggeration to say the C-47 carried a huge burden on the first day of the invasion. The plane kept proving itself after the war too. When the Berlin airlift started on June 26, 1948, US C-47s flew the first 32 missions, delivering 80 tons of food and medicine into West Berlin. Bigger C-54s eventually took over most of the work, but the point was already made. The supposedly outdated design could still handle serious logistics under pressure. Look at the production numbers if you want to understand the scale. Douglas only built 607 civilian DC-3s before and during the war, but military variants like the C-47 and C-53 pushed the total past 16,000 aircraft. The Soviet Union built nearly 5,000 copies under license as the Lusinov Li-2, and Japan manufactured their own version called the L-2D. Very few aircraft in history had been built in these quantities and then stayed in service for decades afterwards. When peacetime arrived, the DC-3 came back already battle-tested. The military sold off thousands of surplus C-47s at bargain prices, and airlines of every size jumped on them. Major carriers like American and Eastern used them on domestic routes, while dozens of smaller airlines in Europe and South America used DC-3s to connect their countries. Bush pilots and regional operators created air links to islands, remote valleys, and mining camps. The Smithsonian doesn't exaggerate when they call it the most successful airliner in aviation's formative years. By 1939, roughly 90% of all airliner flights worldwide were flown by DC-3s or their variants. That kind of dominance lasted well into the late 1940s and early 1950s, especially on routes where bigger four-engine planes just didn't make economic sense. Everything that made the DC-3 valuable in wartime worked just as well in peace. Its short field performance meant you could fly into places with minimal or even no paved runway. The typical cruise speed of 180 to 200 miles per hour and range around 1500 miles matched perfectly with how far people needed to travel. Passengers who were used to cold, bumpy cabins suddenly found themselves in what felt like a solid, modern, even somewhat luxurious aircraft. The DC-3 became more than just transportation, it represented connection mail that actually arrived, markets that could do business together, people who could travel between distant places. When jet airliners started appearing in the 1950s and 1960s, the DC-3 didn't just disappear. 
Instead, it migrated to the edges of the map, to gravel runways, ice strips, jungle clearings, and coastal areas where faster planes with their higher approach speeds and delicate landing gear simply couldn't operate safely. That migration defined what the airplane would become over the next 70 years. If you really want to understand how the DC-3 survived, you need to go north to Alaska and Canada. Modern Alaska still depends heavily on air cargo for villages and work camps that aren't connected to the road system. Desert Air Alaska explains exactly why they still operate DC-3s. These planes can haul up to 6,500 pounds. Their large cargo doors accept awkward oversized loads. They run on big tundra tires, and they operate safely from runways as short as 2,800 feet, including gravel and dirt surfaces. These aren't restored museum pieces, they're working cargo aircraft. Just across the border in Canada's Northwest Territories, Buffalo Airways has built an entire reputation around their green and white DC-3s. They've even had a TV show made about their operations running cargo and charter flights between Hay River, Yellowknife, and other remote communities. Even though Buffalo operates modern jet freighters too, their DC-3s remain what you use when the job requires something stubborn and reliable. The Royal Aeronautical Society described their DC-3 operations as the very definition of practical nostalgia. Anything that fits through the freight door moves, and often these planes make runs twice a day. When wildfires and floods hit the Canadian North in recent years, operators like Buffalo kept supplies flowing into threatened communities. That's when you realize these so-called obsolete airframes become absolutely essential once modern paved infrastructure fails. Back in 2023, Yellowknife faced mass evacuations when unprecedented wildfires cut the road connections and put enormous strain on air transport. Northern carriers, including those flying DC-3s, pivoted immediately to run supply flights whenever they were needed. Down in Colombia and across the Amazon basin, DC-3s still make money the same way they always have, connecting remote communities sitting on rivers deep in the jungle. Places where roads are seasonal at best and often just don't exist. Operators based out of Villa Vicencio, particularly Alianza, keep classic DC-3s and turbine-converted DC-3Ts flying routes into the Amazon and the Eastern Plains. They haul fresh produce and fish out, and bring medicine, fuel, and passengers in. These flights aren't nostalgia tours for aviation enthusiasts. They're literal lifelines for towns whose only connection to the outside world is a thin dirt airstrip carved out of the forest. Over in Southern Africa, a few DC-3s have served the tourism and charter markets for years. South Africa's Springbok Classic Air still runs vintage Douglas flights to remote destinations. More impressively, the South African Air Force operated C-47 TP turboprop conversions for maritime patrol and transport missions well into the 21st century before finally retiring them in 2024. That retirement closed out an absolutely remarkable eight-decade military career for the type. Even after they stopped flying, the South African story proves exactly why the DC-3 lasted. Ruggedness, controllable handling at low speeds, and an ability to accomplish a lot with relatively little. The most surprising place you'll find DC-3s working today is Antarctica. The Basla BT-67, which is basically a heavily modified turboprop DC-3, has become crucial for polar logistics. Companies like Ken Borak Air, under contract to various national Antarctic programs, use ski-equipped Baslers to move people and cargo between ice runways, remote field camps, and even the South Pole itself. Their low approach speeds, excellent short field performance, and long-range fuel capacity make them uniquely qualified for a continent where there are literally no alternate airports and everything is white as far as you can see. From gravel airstrips in Alaska to the ice of Antarctica to the humid heat of the Colombian jungle, the DC-3 keeps showing up wherever conditions get difficult and the work gets real. So what exactly did Douglas get right that lets the DC-3 keep doing this nearly 90 years later? The structure has built-in margin. Engineers in the 1930s designed the airframe using calculations and experience that were pretty conservative compared to today's computer-optimized standards. The result is a structure that has extra fatigue life, assuming operators stay on top of inspections and prevent corrosion, which means it can be refurbished, reskinned, and flown for decade after decade. Boeing currently holds the DC-3's type certificate, inherited through their acquisition of McDonnell Douglas, and maintains it in FAA records as type certificate A669. That paperwork might sound boring, but it's actually crucial because it allows continued maintenance, modifications, and legal commercial operation. The engines are big, simple, and relatively straightforward. The Pratt & Whitney R1830 radials that power most DC-3s and C-47s are mechanically simple by modern standards. They're air-cooled. Many variants use carbureted fuel systems, they run at modest power levels, and they move a lot of air to stay cool. Overhaul shops and parts suppliers still support these engines with new manufactured parts, PMA-approved components, and plenty of salvaged parts from aircraft that might have been retired. 
Maintaining radial engines takes serious labor, but it's something operators with the right experience can handle. Those 1200 horsepower R1830s provide enough thrust to lift substantial payloads from unpaved runways at reasonable speeds. The tailwheel landing gear configuration works surprisingly well in rough terrain. Conventional air can be a liability on smooth airport ramps because of limited forward visibility and the risk of ground loops, but it's an advantage in the bush. The DC-3's nose-high attitude on the ground keeps those large propellers farther away from rucks and ruts. Most of the weight sits over the main landing gear, right where the runway surface is the strongest, and those big low-pressure tires handle soft or uneven ground well. Add in that large effective tail and the DC-3 behaves predictably even on short runways that have crown or camber issues. The short field capability is remarkable for an aircraft of this size. Actual numbers vary depending on weight and conditions, but historical performance data and pilot reports consistently show takeoff rolls under 2,000 feet and landing distances not much longer. Modern operators like Desert Air routinely work from 2,800 foot strips with their DC-3s, and AOPA's historical flight test data confirms the airplane's short field abilities. This isn't an STOL competition winner like you'd see on YouTube, but for an aircraft that can carry 6,000 pounds of cargo, the performance is pretty exceptional. The systems are always entirely mechanical and hydraulic, with no pressurization. There's simply less that can break, less that needs specialized electronic test equipment, and more that a skilled mechanic can diagnose in the field with basic tools and good hands. In remote areas where reliable electrical power can be intermittent and supply chains are long and uncertain, that simplicity translates directly into reliability. Finally, because so many were built, there's a complete global support ecosystem. PMA suppliers manufacture FAA-approved replacement parts, warehouses and salvage yards trade serviceable components, and specialized shops overhaul everything from magnetos to landing gear components. The DC-3 isn't some orphaned one-off design, it has infrastructure behind it. When you put all these factors together, you get an airframe that adapts to almost any mission, which is exactly what the DC-3 has done for nine decades. If the previous section explains why the DC-3 lasted, this part is about how operators are giving it a new life. How do you take an 80-year-old piston-powered airliner and extend its useful service another 30 years? In Oshkosh, Wisconsin, Basler Turbo Conversions does something pretty audacious. They take a retired C-47 or DC-3, cut the fuselage open and stretch it 40 inches, strip the systems down to the bare ribs, replace worn structural elements, and install two Pratt & Whitney Canada PT-6A-67R turboprops producing 1,424 shaft horsepower each. The conversion includes new engine nacelle fairings, upgraded wingtips, modern avionics like terrain awareness systems, traffic collision avoidance, and contemporary autopilots. Customers can add anti-ice boots, bleed air heating, and long-range fuel tanks holding up to 800 extra gallons, along with dozens of other mission-specific modifications. Basler claims their conversion process effectively replaces the majority of the aircraft by value and parts count. It's probably the closest thing to a brand new DC-3 that civilization is ever going to produce. What do you get for that investment? You can burn Jet A fuel, which is far more available in remote regions than scarce 100 LL aviation gasoline. Performance improves significantly in hot weather and at high altitude. The turboprops are much quieter and meet stage 3 noise requirements. They're more reliable and far easier to start in cold weather. Operators from Canada to Antarctica to Africa have adopted BT-67s for cargo work, aerial surveys, parachute operations, and scientific research. National Antarctic programs, including Australia's, Routinely contract ski-equipped Baslers for flights between ice camps where having a range of 950 to 2,140 nautical miles and excellent short-field performance matters far more than cruise speed. The BT-67 doesn't erase what makes the DC-3 special. It refines those qualities. Takeoff and landing distances stay short, approach speeds remain modest, and the cabin volume is unchanged except for that 40-inch forward stretch. The new engines push cruise speed comfortably below 200 knots and add significant payload flexibility. What you end up with is a 1930s airframe that honestly fits certain 21st century missions better than any modern aircraft designs in the same niche. Basler wasn't the first outfit to experiment with turbine power on the DC-3. Back in the 1960s, Jack Conroy tried a version called the Turbo 3 with twin Rolls-Royce Dart engines and an even stranger variant called the Tri-Turbo 3 that had three PT-6 engines, included one mounted in the nose. These were technically interesting but never gained commercial traction. Later, the South African Air Force commissioned the C-47TP conversions using PT-6 engines for maritime patrol missions, an elegant solution that kept the type of military service through the 2010s and into the early 2020s. 
those aircraft were finally retired in 2024, ending what was probably the last continuous military DC-3 operation anywhere in the world. Beyond new engines, operators have modernized avionics and mission equipment extensively. WAAS-capable GPS, glass panel displays, ADS-B transponders, terrain and traffic warning systems, cockpit voice and flight data recorders, and satellite tracking have all been successfully integrated. The polar operations, ski landing gear, fuel heating systems, and comprehensive ice protection packages are standard equipment. Survey operators mount magnetometers and LIDAR systems. Skydiving operators install roller floors and dedicated jump doors. The DC-3 has evolved into a platform that can be customized rather than a fixed specification aircraft. One of the stranger chapters in DC-3 history involves its use as a gunship. The Vietnam-era AC-47 Spooky pioneered the entire concept of side-firing gunship tactics using miniguns and flares dropped for illumination. Decades later in the 2000s, Columbia fielded AC-47T Phantasma variants based on the BT-67 turboprop conversion, equipped with modern sensors and GAU-19-A50 caliber guns for counterinsurgency operations. You really can't get much more refusers to die than watching a 1940s transport aircraft get reborn as a 21st century armed Overwatch platform. Being old is one thing, being indispensable is something else entirely. Why hasn't some modern design replaced the DC-3? In certain ways, it has been replaced. Jets took over the trunk routes, pressurized turboprops handle regional service, and aircraft like the Twin Otter and Caravan work tight remote niches. But in that specific operational slot where the DC-3 excels, carrying 2.5 to 3 tons of payload into short rough runways at low approach speeds through big cargo doors while keeping acquisition and maintenance costs reasonable, the modern aircraft market doesn't have many good answers. New airplanes in this weight class are typically faster, which actually makes them less suitable for short dirt strips. They're significantly more expensive to purchase, and they're optimized for operating from paved runways with support infrastructure. AOPA once put it pretty simply, no competing airplane can do what the DC-3 does for the money. There's another dimension to this beyond just economics. The DC-3 exists within a whole culture of people who know how to keep it flying. Mechanics who can diagnose radial engine problems by touch and sound. Pilots who can read the camber and condition of a gravel bar from 50 feet up on final approach. Dispatchers who know exactly which remote villages can handle a 6,500 pound pallet and which ones need cargo broken down into individual sacks. The DC-3 didn't just accumulate flight hours over nine decades, it accumulated knowledge, procedures, and communities of people. When this airplane shows up somewhere, all that accumulated expertise comes with it. But the legacy goes deeper than nostalgia or romance. This is fundamentally about appropriate technology, Imagine you need to deliver a literal ton of vaccines into an Andean valley at 3,500 feet elevation with a 3,000 foot gravel runway. A sleek modern aircraft with composite construction and turbofan engines might actually be the wrong tool for the job. The right tool could very well be an aluminum airplane that first flew when the Hindenburg was still making passenger flights. Because in the metrics that actually matter for this mission, payload capacity, per foot of runway needed, reliability when approaching at 70 to 90 knots, parts availability in remote locations, the DC-3 remains genuinely competitive. Thanks to conversions like the Basler BT-67, it can even burn the type of fuel that's actually available at remote outposts. Think about where DC-3s are working right now today. Up in Alaska, keeping mines and isolated villages supplied when the weather is doing everything possible to shut down operations. In Canada's far north, where a Buffalo Airways DC-3 is still genuinely the best first choice for certain cargo loads between Hay River and Yellowknife. Down in Colombia, serving jungle communities that would otherwise be completely isolated for months at a time. In Antarctica, where a ski-equipped Basler often makes the difference between a functioning field camp and an abandoned fantasy. There's certain poetry in that, but there's also solid engineering. The DC-3 isn't immortal. It survives because it's maintained. These aircraft get carefully inspected under modern airworthiness regulations. They receive new aluminum skin panels and replacement ribs. PMA approved parts and completely overhauled engines. They get upgraded with modern avionics specifically to prevent controlled flight into terrain accidents and airspace violations. The DC-3 is incredibly old, and yet it has managed to keep up with contemporary requirements.